Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome Anna Purna Basavaraja. She will be speaking to us today about the Martian rocket. She has a PhD. She is a PhD student at the University of Calgary in the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering. She's pursuing research on the experimental studies on hybrid rocket propulsion. Welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, so welcome everyone. And today I'll be explaining about the Martian rocket. Uh, the main reason why I chose to uh, talk about this particular topic is that I see that the students are supposed to design an ascent vehicle for the Mars. So I thought just giving an introduction about the basics of the basic parts of the rocket engine and their functions and how does it work and what are the factors that they should keep in mind when designing a rocket for the atmosphere that is different than the Earth would be very helpful. That's why today I thought of talking about the Martian rocket. So first, let's talk about the rocket engine parts. The reason I chose rocket engine and not just the other structural part is because rocket engine is the one which is called as like a heart of a rocket because this is where the energy comes from and where you can really help this is the part where the energy produces and that can be helpful for the rocket to propel upwards so let's see what are the parts of the rocket engine the first part is the fuel so what exactly we mean by the fuel is it is a substance that burns when combined with oxygen producing gas for propulsion. So this fuel can be either in the form of a solid like we have in the candle wax or in the form of liquid that is the gasoline for example that helps to propel our automobiles for example. And then we have it may also be in the form of a gaseous so the one that we use for camping purpose and all other and all the purposes. So we have basically solid, liquid, and gaseous states in which the fuel can be used. And the next comes the oxidizer. So just the fuel is not really sufficient uh, for the propulsion to take place. We should also have an oxidizer. Now, what do we mean by oxidizer is it is a type of a chemical which donates oxygen to burn the fuel. So basically, this oxygen, we are lucky on the earth because we have around 21 percent of atmosphere consisting of oxygen so it's easily available for us but still for the rocket purpose we try to store them in the tanks and then we try to take it along with it so that it can give the oxidizer and the fuel mixture then once we have the fuel and oxidizer is it just enough for any combustion to take place no we have to complete this triangle here so where we need a ignition source to provide the heat so this ignition source is provided by the igniter so igniter is a device that initiates the combustion so when i say combustion it's nothing but the burning of the fuel and oxidizer this burning of the fuel and oxidizer can take place only in the presence of ignition system so once the ignition takes place, so this igni ignition takes place or the burning takes place inside a chamber called as a combustion chamber. So combustion chamber is a closed vessel where the burning of the fuel takes place. And here it must be so strong, the combustion chambers, that it has to withstand high temperature as high as around 2,500 to 3,500 degrees Celsius. And also, it must be thick enough to withstand the high pressure, about 60 bar. So this is the requirement for designing the combustion chamber. Next, once when we have the combustion chamber giving out the hot gases, these hot gases are then passed to the nozzle. So here in the nozzle, the expansion of these hot gases takes place where it gets accelerated. These, this is where we get the high velocity from the rocket. Okay, so the high velocity can be as high as 1,800 to 4,000 meter per second. This is almost, you can imagine it to be like 11 times the speed of a bullet. Okay, 
So once we have these, so these are basically the parts of the rocket engines. Next, we can move to the rocket engine types. So before we go into the rocket engine types, I would like to explain that any kind of an engine when you try to design, it is the basis is a fuel and oxidizer. Now, what is the source for this fuel and oxidizer decides what kind of a rocket engine that you're developing. For instance, if you try to choose any chemicals, then it is called as a chemical rocket. If you use any source of electricity, then it is called as electrical rocket. If you use any nuclear as a source, then it becomes a nuclear propulsion. So today, what we'll be talking about is the chemical rocket. Chemical rocket is mainly because this is the one that has the highest technology maturity and it is most powerful in order to ascend from one part of the atmosphere to the other part. Okay, from one planet to the other planet. This is where the chemical rockets show its potentiality. And therefore, we talk about the chemical rockets nowadays. So chemical rocket is the one that converts the chemical energy into kinetic energy and thus produces the thrust. So chemical rockets can be further classified as a solid, liquid, or a hybrid. Now, depending on the type of a so, like you know the propellant used. When I say propellant, it's a mixture of the fuel and the oxidizer together. They are called as propellant. So, depending on what form of a fuel and the oxidizer you're using, it is named as a solid, liquid, or a hybrid. So, first one is a solid rocket motor. Here, the fuel and oxidizers are in the form of solid. So, this is how the typically parts of solid rocket motor looks like. So for example, you can see inside there is an igniter as we saw that could, should be a part of a rocket engine. And then there is a motor case around it, which is strong enough to house all the important components inside the engine. Then we have the propellant grain. So when I say propellant grain, again, it's the binding of the fuel and oxidizer together. And then it is kept here. Then at the center, we have a space for the burning to take place. Therefore, it is hollow there. It's a combustion chamber. And then when we have uh, the thermal insulation outside, and also we have the nozzle. So these are some of the important parts of the solid rocket motor. Next, just to give you a uh, feeling about how does a solid rocket motor works. So here we have the igniter. In this particular sense, it's an experimental um, you know, bench for understanding this particular solid rocket motor, you have an externally ignited um, ignition source. And then when we then also we have the propellant grain. So you can see how the propellant grain recedes as the ignition takes place and thus produces the exhaust gases. So this is how a simple working of a rocket, solid rocket motor. Now, the main advantages of solid rocket motor is that it has it produces really high thrust. So this is one of the reasons why they are used in the boosters for any of the rocket engines because of its capability to produce a high thrust. The same reason why you try to use it in the booster stage of a rocket. And also it is pretty simple in the designing because you just have a solid and uh, you have the propellant grain, igniter, it's simple parts. Therefore, for this reason, it has been useful in most of the model rockets where the students can try to understand to get a feeling about how the solid rocket motor works. It's a good experimental platform, for example. Then what we have is a storability. So it is like just before the launching, for example, in liquid rockets, you have to really load it just before the launch so that you, know, you have to maintain the temperature and everything. But this kind of complexity is reduced in solid rocket motor because the propellant grains are already manufactured and you can store it like way in advance, many days or months in advance, and just it will be readily available just before the launch. So one, one other more like advantages of our application of solid rocket motor is that it is really useful to study the atmospheric studies, for example, in the sounding rocket. Therefore, you can try to study the atmosphere, what's happening, just 
not going really into the space, but to st have a atmospheric studies or an idea about it, you can try to use solid rocket motor. One disadvantage of solid rocket motor is that the safety. It's mainly because since I told that the solid uh, fuel and oxidizer are already combined in one stage, and once it is ignited, it's just like a cracker. You can't really stop it, stop burning it. That's why you lose control. If anything emergency happens, you don't have any control over it and it may explode. So keeping this into the mind, uh, we have the liquid rocket engines where we have the fuel and the oxidizer. They are separated. They are kept separated. And you can see we have a separate chambers for fuel and the oxidizer. And also, for example, what we try to use for the liquid rocket engines is a liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen, which is a very high performance. And then we have liquid oxygen and rocket grade kerosene. So these are typical examples for it. And I think even for the Mars, you have to go for something like a liquid rocket, probably like that's a conventional way. Let's discuss about it later. Then coming to the advantages, as I told, like the one, it provides an ability to throttle. When I say throttle, it's nothing but, okay. So basically you can, you, you can, uh, able to control it like uh, whenever you want you see some emergency happening you see something is wrong you can just stop the valve of the fuel as we know that we saw the triangle we need to have fuel oxidizer and an ignition source for any ignition to happen so if you want this ignition or burning to stop then just stop either the fuel flow or the oxidizer flow then your rocket is safe at least it's not gonna explode so it has a start, stop, and restart capability as well. The next is, and comparatively, it has the highest performance, that is the high ISP of the fuels, that is the thermal capacity to produce energy. It's higher in case of the liquid rocket engines. Now, the one disadvantage of liquid rocket engine is that it has it is really complex. As I told, you should have a control valves and uh, the system becomes very complex. And the system, when it comes complex, it is nothing but you're investing more money and therefore the engineers are not really happy about it. So once it's uh, to have a compromise between the solid and the liquid where you have a safety also, but it is pretty simple also, then scientists thought about working on a hybrid rocket engine where you have the solid fuel and the liquid oxidizer. And for the typical examples for this is that for the liquid oxidizer, you can use liquid oxygen. And for the solid fuel, typically you have the HTPB or the paraffin wax. So this is the working of a hybrid rocket engine. Uh, you can see this is just like a demonstration purpose. So behind you have the fuel grain, he just ignited with the ignition system. And then the oxygen gets controlled with the help of an externally uh, control, controllable pressure tank where it can be throttled or controlled amount, depending upon the requirements and then you control the burning rate. So this is pretty simple also because like a solid, you don't have everything embedded, it's pretty simple. And like a liquid, you also have the throttle system. So you can even think about such kind of a hybrid system too. So the advantages of hybrid rocket engine is that you have a medium ISP, even the performance lies between the solid and the liquid. Liquid has a high performance, whereas a, a solid has a high thrust. So this hybrid rocket engine, it gives you kind of in between like a medium ISP also. Then you have start, stop, and restart capability because of the throttling available for the liquid oxidizers. Then it is lower, it has a lower complexity than liquids. Now, once we saw all the basic, how is all the rockets working on Earth? This is how we have been developing. But now, what exactly, how you have to think for designing any ascent vehicle for the Mars? So first think about what's the distance. So basically we have, the Mars is really far, far from 
sun, isn't it? Like when compared to earth, it is far. So when I say it is far, the main thing that is different from earth condition is that the temperature. So the temperature is much, much colder in Mars. Therefore, what you have to think is that the propellant storage condition. Is it really your propellant has to be ready to use or should you have to think about any insulating it and can it withstand such low temperatures or does it freeze at such low temperatures? You should think really about these conditions. Probably that would be the challenging area too, like to choose a propellant and then to help the help it to survive this kind of a low temperature environment. Then let's move on to the Mars atmosphere. So Earth in Earth we have almost hundred times. You know, it's denser than the Mars atmosphere. And also, if you see the composition of the air in the on Earth, we have around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And uh, whereas in the Mars, we have 96% of carbon dioxide. So we can try to think about what exactly we can do with carbon dioxide. And also, it is much thinner. So the resistance is lower. Along with that, we have the gravity also around 62.5% less than that of Earth, which, me which means it also provides lesser resistance to the atmosphere, like when you have to propel the air uh, rocket upwards. So what you can think is, so whenever you think about something has a less resistance, then if you want to compare a rocket that is made on Earth and on Mars, I can see for the same engine performance, for the same uh, ISP propellants and everything, conditions keeping the same, but you want to uh, propel it on a different environment, then you, you can really reach a higher altitude or a higher upper center, isn't it? So that is the advantage of flying a rocket or from the Mars than compared to on Earth. Also, it would need that less number of stages. You don't really have, because probably how if, you, if I have to use three stages on Earth, then I would use just one stage. Who knows? I'll be talking about it later, how to calculate the number of stages. But this is just to give you an idea, like how is it so different and what are the advantages that you can make use from, from like having it on the Mars. The next is, so what propellant could be produced on Mars? So as I told, carbon dioxide is abundantly available. So it's obviously the methane and the oxygen. So this is what is a propellant combination that would be ideal. I'll just try to uh, show you a video here where it's an experimental. Uh, I'll just improve the quality. So it's just an experimental uh, studies done by the students where they try to manufacture the methane gas from the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen. So this is called a sabatier process. This will be really helpful for you guys like when you try to think about the propellant production. I'll just play the video here. So first they are trying to set up where you have, they'll inject with a syringe i think this is a syringe that is going to come now and yes so here's the syringe which consists of about 80 percent 80 ml of hydrogen and 20 ml of methane and then you have some catalyst here where which has some nickel powder quiet sand with a fiberglass mesh on the outer side because you see that they'll induce some heating coming up. So this acts like a catalyst to initiate a reaction between the carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So once it happens, there is a critical temperature where this reaction takes place. Therefore, these guys start to provide the heat from an external source to the catalyst that is present inside the fiberglass where the initiation of the reaction takes place and the formation of methane along with the byproduct of water will be obtained. 
So they try to heat it as much as possible because I believe that the temperature around 400 degrees Celsius is a requirement. So they are trying to heat it up and they are collecting the methane in the, on the other side of the syringe here. They collect about, I think at the end, they'll show about 20% of methane will be produced by this Sabetio process. So this is what you can think about uh, working on which propellant to use rather than taking it from Earth to Mars. You can try to think on in situ how you can build this, you can produce methane over there. And then they'll try to detect it with a methane detector. And then it works. So this is how it is. So this is a very simple experiment. They try to do it. So you can try to think something similar to it for the production of methane on Mars. So then once it is, I just thought of giving you some idea about what is the, when designing a rocket, obviously you have to think about what rocket mass I should work on. Initially, you don't have any idea, isn't it? So how to start with it? So this is a very good um, platform where you can understand about it. Let me explain what does a typically rocket masses consist of. So the rocket mass consists of a payload mass, propellant mass, where it, it includes the fuel and oxidizer. Then you have a structure mass that's outside, which completely depends on what kind of a material are you choosing. Are you choosing a metal or you're choosing a composite to make it lightweight? It all depends on you. And then therefore the initial mass is a combination of the structure mass, propellant mass and the payload mass. Payload mass in your case, for example, you have to carry astronauts. Therefore, the payload will be astronauts or some important measurement equipments, for example. Then at the final state, what you have is just the payload, that is your astronaut, for example, and then the structure. If you try to retain the entire structure, if not, you'll be just left with a payload mass. So the final mass on the other side, you can see it's just the structure mass and the propellant, the payload mass. So what is the difference between the final and the initial is nothing but the propellant mass. So you have to calculate propellant mass initially to any to design a rocket, for example. That you can do by using a rocket equation, which is, says that delta V is equal to VE ln Mi by MF. So ln is a logarithmic function of initial mass and the final mass ratio. VE is the exhaust velocity and delta V is the change of the velocity that is required. For example, here there is a detail about what parameters you should take. So delta V, it completely depends on destination where you want to go. For example, for the Mars, if you decide that you would like to take your astronauts from the surface of the Mars to say just about 100 kilometer, then what is the delta V or what is the change in the velocity that you have to give for the rocket to design, that is one portion. And VE is the exhaust velocity that de completely depends on the propellant combination. For instance, methane and oxygen, you have around the specific impulse of 370 seconds. So with that, you can try to calculate what is the exhaust velocity. Once you have these two, then you should make a rough estimation for your final mass, that is the payload mass. You should just take, like, for example, astronauts, you should just see how many males you would like to choose and how many females, depending on them, you can try to use what is the average weight of, a, like, you know, for a male astronaut and for what is the average weight of a female astronaut, then take it, then plus the spacecraft, they have to be uh, kept inside a module, isn't it? So like a dragon capsule. So what is the typical weight of that? So that you can try to put it here. Then initial mass, with that calculation, you have everything except the propellant mass. So from this equation, delta V is equal to V. So this equation, you have everything except Mi. So Mi, where it consists of rocket propellant. So Mi, first you'll find out. And once you have that Mi, that Mi is the initial mass, which consists of you know, the final mass and the initial mass difference is what you get the propellant mass. 
So once you have Mi, Mf minus Mi will give you the propellant mass. So this is how you find the propellant mass that is required to go from any destination. So this delta V value, you can get in from the internet, wherever you want, like you just put it from this kilometer to that and you to get try to get this value. So it's all available in the internet sources. You just have to use these equations. So the next one and the last part is that the optimum number of rocket stages. So as I told already, on Earth, we need more stages. But whereas comparatively, on, Earth, on Mars, you really need less number of so stages. So how do I calculate how many number of stages? So you can try to use it, this formula, where it is the optimum, opt is nothing but the optimum number of stages, n is the number of stage, which is equal to 1.12 that is an empirical factor that you get by doing many experiments so right now you can try to use this factor 1.12 times delta v divided by ve where delta v depends on destination as i already mentioned and v is a propellant combination which are easily available data on the internet so once you have this you can find out the number of stages i just try to work a small problem for you for instance to take the payload from you know earth to leo orbit leo is a low earth orbit that we have around the earth so the i need the delta v around 9400 meter per second and the exhaust velocity is about 4410 meter per second but this is for a particular uh, co propellant combination of hydrogen liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and the number of optimum stage, what you get is 2.38 stages, but you can't have really a 0.38 stage. So you need to round it off and get two stages. So this is what is the number of stages that you would like to use. So similarly, you have to do it for even Mars. So this is for the reference. I would like to ask you all of the students to read this particular book, The Case for Mars, written by Robert Zubrin. This is a very helpful book for the initial start of the mars thing and uh yes that is it like all the best for all the students you can do your best and try to achieve as much as you can and you are doing oh no that's it i'm done <laughs> i was gonna say they are supposed to be reading the case for mars as part of the curriculum and okay. we do have some questions mm -hmm. um david would like to know do you think we'll ever get to light speed with a rocket i presume he's meaning oh uh, this is right now with the current technology i don't think so we can try to reach this particular speed because imaginary we have number of you know uh, uh, theory theoretical coming with a with what kind of uh, technology that you use like if you use a plasma all the energetic particles that itself is traveling with the speed of light but it has to carry the mass also with it so it's pretty difficult with the current te technology that's what i would like to say and just to add to that it's been said by scientists that it would take infinite energy to move one particle at the speed of light and we don't have infinite energy to move one particle and as we know rockets and people are made of a lot of particles <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay uh thank you for that answer when can another question when can we when do you think we'll have the technology to get to mars faster than the quickest which is six to seven months at this time so it's all about uh, the development, I can say. So we, if we just imagine uh, with the current technology, what we have with the chemical is that is what is binding our, you know, the speed limit to reach the Mars. But in case if we try to use it with the propulsion systems like the nuclear, for, exa for example, where you really have it, but with the safety to, to take into consideration. So it's all up to the humans with how fast we really work on the technology. Or if you find out any uh, rock, like thermal rocket, like a you know, chemical rocket that is just doing a magic with no time to propel. So that would be the reason. So I think that technology talking in, to give a basic reason like how how much time it's really a tricky question i i think so to answer it in one word because it depends on various factors where we want to go and how fast we have to go with the 
but it's on the horizon, right? We're hoping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Alden wants to know, out of the different types of rockets you mentioned, which specific type, solid, liquid, or hybrid, is most suitable for launching a mission for Mars, or is it a combination of multiple? I think it's a combination of multiple also could be there. Right now, people are doing it on methane and oxygen. That's why we are looking for it. But simply just to give an example, you can use it for hybrid also. Yes, people have not thought about it, but hybrid is basically you use a, like a plastic also as a fuel. So if you try to use all the plastic waste, like whatever the astronauts are trying to use and try, instead of trying to dispose it, if you're trying to manufacture it or with the carbon dioxide that you have more in the atmosphere, trying to extract the plastic out of it, like try to manufacture the carbon content and the plastic and ready to use, you can use it as a fuel. So anything is possible. So I just don't want to limit the students, you know, uh, thinking capability to just methane and just to that. But you're free to do as crazy as you want because rocket works like that. Thank you. Um, another question. What fuel can we make in situ from the Martian, you know, atmosphere or regolith? What can we make on Mars? Let's say they land there and they need fuel, but they don't have any resources that they brought with them. Yeah, as I mentioned, the methane production using the Sabatia process, that would be most feasible because we have ample of like carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere. I think we have to use that. Is there enough hydrogen on Mars? Or do Either we need you to bring Mark? To, excuse me. Do we need to bring hydrogen? Uh, there are two options. Either because hydrogen is light in weight, you can carry it from all the way from Earth to Mars, or you can also try to, you know, uh, in situ produce this particular uh, hydrogen by because, as I told in the pro uh, video I just showed, in the Sabatier process, one of the byproducts you're getting is the water. So try to do electrolysis and try to extract hydrogen out of it. So that is also possible. So either you can produce it on site or take it from Earth. So it's all possible. Well, they have heard a lot about water in the last few days. So they know that they can use the water there. <laughs> yeah, that's well and good also. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, students, any more questions? Um, if while we're waiting for students to um, ask any more questions, we have several more students joining over the next couple of days. Um, I have updated the syllabus with the link from the first day's video. Those videos will be uploaded each day, allowed 24 to 48 hours for those to be uploaded to YouTube. Um, please rewatch them if you need to. Also linked in the syllabus is the playlist for YouTube for all of last year's videos and all of this year's videos. So that is going to be updated regularly. So if you miss a live video, please watch those on replay once they're uploaded. Always remember, you can email me with any questions. I'm going to try to start putting teams together by Friday to give you guys an extra week um, to work together as we finish up the um, lectures next week and make sure you put your time zone in the time zone spreadsheet. You have the syllabus and the rubric and the spreadsheet all linked. I've shared it with everyone. If you did not get it, please email me. Okay, any other questions? Okay, tomorrow we have, let me let you know what tomorrow's schedule is. Tomorrow's schedule is Tony Rice, what's the weather like on Mars and why it matters? Uh, Madhu Thangvalu, humans on Mars, past, present, and future. And Trudy Hugenboom, Hugenboom will be speaking tomorrow, I believe, about human factors. Okay, students, let's thank um, Annapurna. And we appreciate your participation. And as I told the students, this talk will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you want to share it, um, feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Yes, Trudy Hugenboom. Do you know Trudy, Cal? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful.
She's talking in this time slot tomorrow. Oh, she was your teacher. Oh, I'm so excited that you'll get to see her again. Well, I'm excited. Um, that's awesome. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.